So today we are very happy to have Federico Bonetti from Oxford, who's going to tell us about symmetry field theories from string theory. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be given this chance to uh, tell you something about uh, my, my work uh, in this area. And um, to start with, I'd like to uh, give though a, a general introduction and also discuss um, aspects that are not directly related to my work, but trying to provide a, a more general uh, framework uh, that can hopefully be useful for then the second half of the talk. And I think I don't have to convince this audience that the language of quantum field theory is extremely useful in all various areas of physics, but nonetheless, it's also fair to say that there is a lot that we still don't know about quantum field theory. And, uh, and therefore, any lesson that we can learn, especially about non perturbative aspects, uh, can be extremely useful and it's always welcome. So, in, in this uh, very large endeavor, um, global symmetries are known to be very powerful tools that help us analyze uh, quantum field theories in a variety of contexts. Because as we, as we know, for instance, they organize the spectrum of operators, they constrain correlators in the theory. Um, often they have uh, Toft anomalies, which provide further um, interesting observables. And while all of these ideas are very old, what has emerged uh, more recently is a novel way of rethinking about some of these old ideas, which makes it easier to then generalize it to novel concepts. And in a nutshell, we can say that um, what happens to be the case is that global symmetries should be regarded as a topological subsector of the quantum field theory that we would like to study. And so let's uh, have a very quick look at why this point of view um, uh, holds and, and why uh, it can be useful in uh, extending uh, more familiar concepts towards uh, in new directions. So. Um, Let's see. Uh, this is uh, probably also very familiar to uh, people in the audience. It's essentially a rewriting of a very familiar concept, say a U1 global symmetry in your favorite D dimensional theory. We know from uh, that there, it's going to exist a textbook method current that is conserved. And now instead of focusing on the local conserved current operator, we consider non local operators that we obtain by integrating the star of J on a co-dimension one submanifold. And really all we have done is just a translation, but this way of thinking modifies, uh, translates the uh, conservation of the current into the statement that now this extended operator is topological. We can deform uh, the thing I'm calling sigma D minus one a little bit, and we're not going to affect the operator U. And moreover, uh, we also know that uh, since these operators are topological, we can move them. And in particular, if we pick one of them to surround a local operator O, we can shrink it. And this amounts to implementing the action of the U1 symmetry on the local operator O. And moreover, since again, we can move these objects around, we can imagine taking two of them to be parallel and uh, bring them together. And what we find is a fusion law that mirrors the product in the U1 group. And the idea is that once we have a translation of all these familiar concepts in this language, we can easily consider all sorts of interesting generalizations. The first game that we can play is a game of dimensions and co-dimensions. So we can change the dimension of the charged object. It would be this red line, for instance, curly O. And, and then it's, built, it's gonna link clearly also with a topological operator with a co-dimension it's no longer one. And this is ultimately the origin of higher form symmetries. And, and in a sense, even more interestingly, even though they're not gonna play uh, a, a role in what I'm talking about today, is the possibility of generalizing the fusion law, uh, allowing essentially for more than one term on the right-hand side, mirroring uh, therefore uh, what happens in, in category theory where we find structures that are no longer uh, group-like, but exhibit a wilder um, variety of phenomena. Now, uh, why should we care about this rephrasing and all these generalizations? One reason is that while these uh, are 
generalized global symmetries, they share many features with ordinary ones, features that we know and like and appreciate because of their implications in our study of QFTs. Just to name a few examples, uh, we know that global symmetries can undergo spontaneous breaking. The same holds true for generalized symmetries. And I think here the prototypical example that comes to mind is the spontaneous breaking of one from symmetries, which is known to be a diagnostic tool for confinement in gauge theories. As I mentioned, global uh, symmetries might have Tooft anomalies. Um, if they are free of those, they can be gauged. And, and this is a statement that pertains also to generalized symmetries. And if the anomaly, the Tooft anomaly, it's not zero, then it's also known that it has to be uh, matched, for instance, under RG flow or uh, continuous deformations of the parameters. And therefore we can constrain phases of theories. And there have been also applications, for instance, even to non-supersymmetric four dimensional gauge theories. Um, so that's to say that since, uh, uh, since generalized symmetries share all this um, useful feature with the ordinary ones, it is very valuable to, um, to study them and try to understand them in a systematic way. Not only uh, I would like to emphasize the topological nature of global symmetries in the two-dimensional theory that we are actually interested in studying, I would also like to emphasize that it's actually very convenient to also think of an auxiliary topological theory that lives uh, in one dimension higher. So let's say that D is the name of space-time, the number of space-time dimensions where our uh, QFT of interest lives. Uh, there is going to be curly T. Uh, this auxiliary theory is going to live in D plus one dimensions, and I'm going to call it uh, curly A. And I'm going to refer to it as the symmetry field theory of the theory that we would like to study. Now, why, uh, what's the purpose in life, so to say, of this object? Um, it's twofold. On the one hand, uh, it can encode Toft anomalies for generalized global symmetries. And here, of course, the, interesting, the most interesting ones are the ones that are not ordinary continuous symmetries. But on top of that, at the same time, it can also account for uh, possible global structures that we might have in our theory D. And, and I will describe a little uh, more precisely what I mean by this um, in, in a moment. And, uh, and a final point that uh, might be worth uh, emphasizing is that as you can, uh, as you can see, uh, this topological point of view doesn't rely on a perturbative or weakly coupled Lagrangian description. I'm not referring to elementary fields and their interactions or an action or anything like that. Of course, if those are available, they can be very useful in addressing these questions. But the point uh, I'd like to make is that the uh, definition of these uh, uh, gadgets, so generalized global symmetries and the associated symmetry field theory does not rely on, on those Lagrangian concepts. And, and that's, it's particularly um, important in the framework of um, field theories that originate from uh, string theory, as, as we will see. Um, and indeed, um, why, um, how can we combine this sort of first uh, collection of observations that was about quantum field theory as it is in general with, uh, with string theory, just like the other half of the title of the talk. And, and here the motivation to establish a connection is the observation uh, that in, in the past few years, um, string theory and M theory have proven extremely useful in furthering our understanding of quantum field theory. And for instance, to most probably one of the most striking predictions of string theory is the existence, for instance, of non-trivial interacting uh, fixed points in higher dimensions in five and six. And those would be extremely hard to argue for using purely field theoretical means. And in a sense, it's precisely because of string theory that we believe that they exist. And more generally, um, I would say that the key feature of thinking about QFTs in string theory is that we are essentially changing the way in which we um, give the model that we would like to study. It's not about uh, 
say, enumerating a set of fields and some representation of some gauge group or anything like that. It's about specifying a string background, which, depending on the context, might mean depend inserting, for instance, brains um, in, in a specific way or um, probing a singular geometry with prescribed characteristics. Now, sometimes it happens that from the geometry, we can extract what the field theory is and then study it purely by field theoretical means. But I would say that a more natural uh, point uh, of view in this context would be to try and get as much information as possible on the field theory directly from its geometric definition in the sense of the data that specify, for instance, the brain configuration if we're using brains or the properties of the singular geometry that we would like to probe. And, um, and, and this is, of course, particularly uh, important if we do not know uh, an alternative uh, Lagrangian uh, formulation of the theory we would like to study. And of course, this is a very broad question, so it's hard to give a, an answer that it's both very general and very accurate. But uh, I would like yet to give you a general sort of philosophy at least on how this problem can be tackled. And that's something that I'd like to refer to as thinking of this QFT as an edge mode in supergravity. And here the uh, main idea would be to think of this <clears throat> uh, localized degrees of freedom that uh, comprise the theory of interest, curly T, as something that it's localized on our brain or on our singularity. And these uh, localized objects effectively act as a source in the ambient space that surrounds them. And that ambient space uh, is going to be described by a supergravity theory in 10 or 11 dimensions, depending on the uh, specific constructions that we are studying. And, and now, uh, the, the key idea that we would like to leverage as much as possible is that the uh, while it might be very hard to make a quantum computation on T directly, uh, it might be much easier to do a semi-classical computation in the supergravity theory that describes the ambient space that surrounds this localized degree of freedom. And then try from that to learn about what's happening in the quantum theory of curly T. And maybe as I was going through these circle of ideas, this has reminded you of holography. And of course, there's no coincidence. It's very similar in spirit. But, the, but I think it's important to keep in mind that this uh, approach is um, actually more general. Because for instance, uh, as I'll uh, illustrate in an example, we can apply this philosophy to theories that emerge from uh, M theory probing a singular geometry uh, without any brains. And in that case, it's far from obvious that a holographic, a standard holographic uh, point of view can be applied. But nonetheless, this edge mode point of view uh, or, uh, can be uh, leveraged and, and can be used to extract information on the QFT using a semi-classical computation. Okay, um, so essentially this was a uh, an introduction to give you a little bit of context and essentially also what is the big picture and ultimately what we would like to compute. Uh, next, I'm, I'm going essentially to take a step back and, in, and talk about symmetry field theories in general before uh, making a connection with string theory. So section two is going to be mostly um, reviewing uh, results that are not mine, but uh, in the hope of giving and giving you some, some background material that is going to be useful for uh, then section three, in which we tackle this uh, question. And namely, if I give you a string uh, setup, how can you compute the symmetry field theory of the QFT that uh, we are realizing? And uh, and I will discuss that in two examples to give you a flavor of different sort of things that can be done in this context. And maybe one example involves brain sources, M5s to be precise. And the second example is going to be instead purely geometric engineering. And then I'll briefly uh, conclude. 
Okay, so uh, if there are no questions on the general introduction, I think we can uh, move to uh, to the second part. And here, I would like to um, essentially explain the terminology, symmetry field theory, and what it's um, it's useful for. And in order to do that, I uh, would like to start with some standard remarks on Toft anomalies, essentially just to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all using the same terminology. So um, the core idea of a, a Toft anomaly for a global symmetry is that we can take our, our field theory, currently T, and if it has a global symmetry, which could be ordinary or generalized, continuous or discrete, internal or space-time, there is a whole variety of those. At least schematically, we can always couple it to a background field. Here I'm denoting that A, because of course I have in mind maybe the more familiar situation of a continuous uh, zero form ordinary symmetry for which we have the background is a connection on a, on a gauge bundle. But, but this could be a discrete object, it could be something more abstract, like a choice of maybe spin connection, for instance. The point, though, that it's common to uh, all uh, examples that, are, uh, that I'm going to discuss is that if we perform a gauge transformation of the background field A, uh, the partition function of our uh, TFT coupled to that background gauge field might fail to be invariant. It might pick up a phase, and that might, and of course, this is only interesting when we cannot cure this uh, mismatch by adding a local counter term in D dimensions. So when that happens, that's precisely when we say that there's a Toft anomaly. And in other words, if you prefer, you can think of this as the fact that when we say partition function is not truly a function of the background fields, but it's rather a section of, of a line bundle that lives on the space of background fields, at least intuitively speaking. And this last uh, bullet point, in a sense, it's the more historic perspective on uh, Toft anomalies. Uh, but the, perspect the perspective that makes more contact with the symmetry TFT is uh, slightly different, even though it's equivalent. Uh, and, and therefore, let's uh, turn uh, to that. Essentially, the, another way of thinking about the same physical phenomenon is that uh, um, could I ask on the previous slide? Um, could I ask uh, you to sure. stop the pre previous slide? Um, could you comment on, the, from this point of view, uh, what it means to be a local or a global anomaly? Um, from this point of view, we can um, essentially we have to see whether the gauge transformation that we are performing can be thought of as being connected to the identity or not, I would say. Um, Is it like if, if it's a local anomaly, the line bundle has some curvature? Precisely, indeed. Pre in, if, indeed. Uh, if it's a global anomaly, the, it's flat, but there's some... Uh, absolutely, the, precisely local, because it's all again if you wish of uh, holonomies around loops, and if for infinitesimal loops, that's precisely contains the same information as the curvature of the bundle, whereas for uh, sort of large loops, that would be a global effect that we cannot detect uh, locally. Okay. And in some sense, the curvature of this line bundle is, is what you might have encoded in like the anomaly polynomial for a, a local. Absolutely, yes. indeed, that's precisely the chain. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Yes, this, uh, there is though, as I was mentioning, a, a slightly different but equivalent way of thinking about the same physics. Namely, we can, if we want to restore gauge invariance on the background gauge transformation, the price to pay is to add a T plus one dimensional bulk to our system. So we wanted to study curly T and now we're studying a combined system of curly T and curly A. Now for ease of exposition, let me make the simplifying technical assumption that not our space-time can be uh, seen as the boundary of an auxiliary space in one dimension higher, and also that the background field we're interested in, A, can also be extended to the bulk. And, and this can be denoted schematically in this sort of collective notation. 
And if in this uh, situation, uh, we can, if we wish to find a, um, an improved version of our partition function by dressing the uh, partition function of the theory we're interested in with the partition function of this curly A theory. But as you can see now, the result depends on the bulk. So it's no longer, if you wish, a purely d-dimensional quantity. However, the, why is this an improvement? Well, because uh, the purpose in life of this curly A theory is precisely that if we define it on a space with a boundary, it's also not gauge invariant by itself, but its gauge variation uh, is engineered to cancel precisely the anomalous gauge variation of our d-dimensional QFT curly T so that their product is indeed gauge invariant. And not only that, this is achieved without introducing propagating degrees of freedom in the auxiliary bulk. So A, in other words, is topological, at least what a physicist would call topological. Um, and so in this language- Federico, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah, hi, this is Nitu. So in your bulk theory, are, your, uh, are the extended uh, connections uh, a, the fields. Um, what are your fields going to be for the the theory yeah, in the bulk? Yes, we can at least informally we can think of the theory in the bulk as having a Lagrangian, which is exactly a local functional of the background field, a hat. Yes. Um, I, I, so so, yeah. sorry. So then, are you instead of are you getting sort of like a pre-quantum line bundle? Um, uh, for the bulk, because you're sort of getting phases parametrized by fields, right? Yes, um, I think, I, mean, I have to admit that I'm not 100% uh, proficient in the quantum line bundle terminology, but my understanding is that what you're describing is exactly um, what was happening, especially uh, if we focus on the Toft anomaly part of the game. Then, right. I mean, yeah. if we if we take an example of, say, for instance, of WZW on the boundary, and then Chern Simons in the bulk, what you'd be getting is the pre quantum Chern Simons line bundle, right, for the bulk, as opposed to the state space for Chern Simons. Um, yes. I mean, I, uh, let me. Sorry, I, I don't I mean to disrupt. No, 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 uh, it's, it's a good point. And the point actually that I would like to address um, because it, it, in a sense, it's what motivates the terminology symmetry field theory as opposed to anomaly field theory. Ah, so I, I would say that, so hopefully this will become a little more clear in the following, but I can anticipate that indeed um, this, the, the uh, pre-quantum line bundle uh, is essentially, I think, what maybe a physicist would call a classical field theory, just something whose action is a local functional of a hat. And indeed, it gives, you, it gives you precisely a phase, which is this anomalous phase that it's supposed to cancel the quantum Toft anomaly. But, but we can also play the other game you alluded to, namely something that has a non trivial state space when you put it on a co dimension one. Um, manifold and and that also plays a role it's sort of the other ingredient in the symmetry field theory that makes it a little richer than anomaly field theory proper uh, but uh, hopefully this uh, will become a little more clear uh, uh, soon thank you that's Sorry. helpful thanks thank you um okay uh and indeed i think i have already uh sort of spelled out some of the uh, keywords and um, what's another way of thinking about this combined bulk boundary picture? It's an, another way of saying it is that we are thinking of our TFT as being a relative field theory relative to the theory curly A. And, um, and though for, for this for the time being, at least in this slide, I will be restricting myself to the case in which curly A is an invertible uh, field theory. Which now, in order to spell out the precise definition, one would have to go through the, say, the axioms of, of what QFT is as a functor between, uh, say, coordinate category and some other category. But we would not need to, to do that. Uh, we can intuitively borrow some of the things we know from QFT in general. 
well, namely that if you give me a d dimensional, or say a d plus one dimensional QFT, and you feed it a closed top dimensional manifold, it will give you a number, the partition function. Whereas if you feed it something that's one dimension lower, it will give you in general a vector space, the states that it will associate to that. In an invertible field theory, these are not a random number. It's actually a an, an zero complex number, which was also a phase because of unitarity. And also the vector space cannot be an arbitrary vector space. It has to be one dimensional. And now, of course, any complex one dimensional space is isomorphic to the complex numbers. But the point is that that doesn't have to be canonical. And in a sense, the, what's happening here is that we are associating several copies of C that depend on the space of background fields, roughly speaking. And, but the fact that they're not canonically identified is a way of recovering, at least roughly speaking, this picture of the partition function as a section of the line bound. Um, so that somehow my attempt to establish a connection between these two ideas. But the, uh, the take home message of this slide is that we can, it, it's convenient to think of the partition function of curly T, the physical theory, not as just being a number, but as being a state in the Hilbert space of curly A. -T. May and I make a comment? Mm -hmm, sure. I think a, a better definition of an invertible field theory would just be a classical field theory, because that's what it is <laughs> appropriately formalized. Uh, yes, no, that, that's, yeah, that's definitely a, a way that it's more familiar, I guess, for the physicists. Uh, yes, no, that, that's, a, that's a good comment, thank you. Um, Okay, so uh, before moving on, um, it's definitely a quick, useful. quick, a quick follow up question. Mm -hmm, is, it, sure. is it true that all invertible field theories are, are of this type, that they're kind of classical field theories, some local functional, some phase that's just a local functional? You just unpack the definition. The number that the speaker referred to is the action, and the state space is one dimensional because there are no quantum effects. It's literally a definition of a classical field theory but made rigorous. Okay, but I'm asking in the other direction is, are all invertible field theories of that type? Or could it be that there are some that obey these axioms that are not? Uh, that type? If you tell me what your definition of a classical field theory is, I can answer the question, but this is my definition of a classical field theory. Yes, that's a question of definitions. I, um, I, I, sorry, I don't mean to, I don't know much about this, but I remember this discussion from a, a different uh, venue. And I understand that there are classical, um, there are invertible theories that are not classical and it has to do with locality. So you can come up with invertible field theories that have to do with characteristic numbers of a manifold and you can cook it up so that those things are not local. So you can't find a Lagrangian for them. Uh, that's what I remember. Again, I don't have details. So I just wanted to put that in. So any acceptable definition of an invertible field theory would be in the fully extended uh, case, in which case that objection doesn't uh, arise. But uh, maybe that what Nick too is referring to is the eta invariant, the theory of the eta invariant, which is invertible, but you cannot write a Lagrangian for it. Yeah, but that's an unextended, that corresponds to an unextended topological field theory. Yeah, but you cannot write an action for it, right? Uh, yeah, that's true, but who cares? Yeah, it's a matter of definition. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sorry for that. No, no. Uh, actually, it's because <laughs> I think I I have to I'm going to mention it in very this slide, so it was <laughs> uh, very uh, useful preparation. Um, so I thought in this slide of trying to make a connection between this more abstract and sort of modern point of view and something that it's presumably the first kind of anomaly, quantum anomaly that we first encountered the famous triangle diagram in four dimensions. And here we know that it's actually most convenient to describe the anomalies in terms of an anomaly polynomial through the famous distinct relations. And this, the anomaly polynomial is precisely the curvature of this anomaly uh, line bound line, as Matthew was mentioning earlier. And in the case of say a, for instance, a U1 
uh, zero form symmetry, we can have a cubic anomaly, which is just as a four, as a six form, it's just literally F2 wedge, F2 wedge F2, where this is the field strength of the background. And then we can, it's easy in this case to perform the same, for instance, uh, in a fairly explicit way. And now the natural question would be, what, what is the anomaly theory in this case? And the correct mathematical answer is the modified eta invariant as proven by Dai and Fried satisfies all the gluing axioms of the QFT. So that's the correct mathematical answer, but at least in the back of my mind, I also have a more hand wavy, uh, but sort of maybe more physics friendly way of picturing. It. And namely, I'm sort of thinking of this as being an act, a, a theory whose action is the transcendent step in, in the descent equations. And while this point of view is not exactly rigorous, I think it can be useful in, in sort of having, giving us some intuition. And in particular, um, this means that it, it confirms the, the, in, the, the way of thinking about continuous uh, anomalies in terms of an anomaly polynomial, because if, if we want to describe a transcendence action in a uh, sort of uh, concise and economic way, we can do it by describing the, the six form, uh, the gauge invariant enclosed I six that corresponds uh, to the transcendence I phi. And uh, now I'd like to uh, sort of change gear and discuss briefly another example that's maybe less familiar and it's purely in the realm of discrete symmetries. And namely, um, it's, it's an example that I consider because it will pop up later uh, towards the end. And uh, it's an anomaly in 5D or 5D QFT that has a uh, one form symmetry, which is discrete. It's a cyclic CN. In this case, the uh, background field is, uh, is in H upper two with values in, in ZN. And the uh, anomaly theory is this, uh, this is described by this classical action. It's essentially uh, uh, BQ. And and, and here, the information about the anomalies contained is this coefficient alpha, which is a suitable rational number, and it's only defined mod one, um, in that if it's an integer, there is no anomaly. And uh, it, again, at least intuitively, or sort of maybe not fully rigorously from a mathematical point of view, we can think of what's happening when we put this theory on something, on, on a space with a boundary, in that case, we will observe a failure of gauge invariance. If you interpret gauge invariance as the choice of a different co-cycle representative for your cohomology class. So in that sense, uh, while there is no descent and there is no anomaly polynomial, there is still a notion uh, in which this, uh, this object has a gauge variation when you put it on a space with a boundary. And, uh, and this is not just some uh, abstract possibility, something that could happen in a field theory. It is known to happen. And one simple example is, the, is, the, is this SUP uh, five dimensional gauge theory with a transcendence level Q, because one can show that the uh, anomaly theory for this uh, model indeed contains this coupling with a given non trivial uh, Toft anomaly coefficient that depends on the integers P and Q of the model. So these were two uh, examples, one sort of old and one slightly newer of the anomaly part of the symmetry field theory. But uh, it's actually useful to relax the invertibility assumption and see and, and regard our th uh, theory as being relative to some curly A, which is not necessarily invertible. And in particular, one of the uh, things that could happen is that now the space of states that curly A associates to our two dimensional space time could be no longer, it doesn't have to be one dimensional necessarily anymore. And, and this is a way of describing a situation in which our QFT T doesn't really have a single partition function, but rather a vector of partition function. And this is a phenomenon that happens in a variety of contexts. Uh, one uh, probably sort of the context in which it was presumably first appreciated um, is uh, chiral to the irrational CFTs. Uh, but a, a very similar version of uh, this also happens, for instance, to 60 to zero uh, super conformal field theories labeled by an AV Lie algebra, except in the case of the A, which, is like, uh, which doesn't have a vector partition function. 
And, and as I, uh, I think I alluded to before, we prefer to think of symmetry field theory because for us, invertibility is not one of the strict requirements because we would like to describe, for instance, this sort of physical situations. And, and not only this case, um, having a non-invertible curly A is also useful in relation to global structures. And here, when I say global structures, I'm referring to the phenomenon for which uh, sometimes it happens that two distinct QFTs in the same dimension have the very same spectrum of local operators, but they have different spectra of extended operators. Um, and in here, the canonical example uh, I have in mind is for the four dimensional gauge theories that are based on the same Lie algebra. So they have the very same uh, spectrum of gauge invariant local operators, but they can have different lines as it was emphasized in these uh, famous papers. And, and remember, since higher form symmetries uh, detect precisely extended operators, saying that they have a different spectrum of lines is essentially equivalent of saying that they have different global, different forms of uh, higher form symmetry, uh, different one form symmetries, say, in the case of lines. And, and therefore- I had a report. Yes. Uh, so I just have a question on the last slide on the six, uh, 60 to comma zero theory. So for the EA case, uh, this theory is non-anomalous. Um, uh, here I meant that the it's still in uh, that if we turn on the if we turn off the background fields, uh, it's an absolute field theory. It it, ha it does have a single well-defined partition function. Um, it, it it does have soft anomalies, but in a sense those are visible once you turn on. Uh, spectrum fields. Whereas for the other uh, 60 to zero cases, even if you turn off all the background fields, you will find generically that you have a vector of partition function. Uh, so, well, oh, oh, I see. So it's still a non Lagrangian series, essentially a string, uh, but it's like it's an absolute theory in this sense. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, actually, thank you for the question because um, I, in one of the previous slides, I think I said something like, let's think of our theory as being relative to the anomaly field theory, which is perfectly okay, especially if you unpack the definition. But, um, but I think it's also common, maybe more common to use the relative qualification in this context when you have a vector of partition functions. So in other words, when your theory remains relative, even after you turn off all your background fields, because you don't want to probe to off the phenomenon, you just want to consider the theory. Um, okay. Um, okay, yes, fine, uh, thanks. Thank you. Mm, so um, what, what is the sort of canonical example of this situation where we can see uh, all of that? Um, well, hold on. So before discussing the example, um, let, let's uh, discuss a bit more of the general picture. Um, so here I'm imagining one of the situations where we have a choice of global structure. What, what does that mean? So one way to think about it is that, um, so the object, the, the key ingredient uh, in the story is curly T, is our relative field theory, relative in the sense that it lives at the boundary of a bulk that admits a non-invertible symmetry field theory, curly A. But one might ask, how do we turn this relative field theory into a more ordinary field theory that might have two of anomaly, but only has a single partition function? And one way to do this in general uh, is to imagine that our non-invertible symmetry field theory, curly A, has a gapped interface with an invertible anomaly theory, A prime. And in a sense, since all of this is topological, we can now imagine to collide the gap interface with curly T. And then what we would get would be an ordinary field theory that has some total knowledge. And the, the choice of gap interface is essentially equivalent to choosing a set of operators in our relative field theory that are mutually local. Because so the one problem, so to say, one pathology of curly T as a relative field theory is that it possesses operators that are mutually non-local, but we can 
make a choice of a maximally neutrally local subset, and that's equivalent to the choice of these cap into phase. Um, so all of this is true in general, but maybe phrased this way can sound a little abstract. But luckily, there is a very concrete example that we can consider to see a, an explicit realization of all these ideas. And, and the example I have in mind is uh, a, a TFT in, in 5D that it's usually called a DF theory. And well, actually, of course, it exists in various dimensions with various P form potentials, but let's focus on this uh, instance. The fields are a couple of two form fields, uh, B2 and C2, and they're normalized so that their field strengths uh, have integer fields. Then uh, the action takes this sort of um, transignments of diagonal transignments form, if you wish, with an integer coefficient n. And uh, one can see that the equations of motion of the uh, system imply that on the one hand, both B2 and C2 are flat, and also that their holonomies, which a priori are elements of U1, are actually contained in a ZN subgroup of U1. Um, so that what this Lagrangian is actually describing for us, it's a five dimensional gauge theory with discrete gauge field whose gauge group is ZN. And there's two of them, B2 and, and C2. Um, okay. Um, and what can we uh, say and maybe a more uh, quantitatively about this? Well, this is a, a theory that has no local operator that's interesting because the, everything is flat. Uh, but we do have holonomies or Wilson lines. And, and as usual, we define them by uh, integrating our uh, potentials on, on the appropriate surfaces here are two dimensions. And, and they also have little n, it's simply a charge uh, that it's defined modulo n. And now, if we wish, if we adopt the Lagrangian point of view, the non triviality of this theory is encoded in this correlator. If you have a Wilson surface for B2 and one for C2, the correlator is this phase that knows about the uh, linking number of these two surfaces inside the end of 5D space. Uh, there is an alternative way of thinking about the same physics, uh, which is more Hamiltonian in, in, in flavor. And namely, we can literally perform canonical quantization if we select the direction to be uh, Euclidean time. And in that sense, uh, the, the objects of interest are still Wilson lines, but in this case, if they lie in the spatial slice, we think of them as operators. And, and therefore, they're going to have uh, no trivial commutation relations. And in particular, it turns out that they obey these uh, vial commutation relations that are very similar, actually, to the exponentiated version of the famous commutator of X and P in quantum mechanics. They look pretty much the same. And they contain the same information, except that this time it's phrased in terms of the integer intersection numbers between these two surfaces inside our spatial slides. But that's to say that if you detect either this correlator or this biocommutation relation, that's the hallmark, the smoking gun for a DF theory. And ultimately, it's also the reason why this is not convertible, because we, we will have to uh, essentially find a representation of that biocommutation relation, which is non trivial. And uh, as was, for instance, uh, shown by Witten, actually, the space states that this theory associates to uh, M4 uh, closed manifold uh, is labeled by elements in this cohomology group, which, depending on our choice of M4, might uh, be uh, consisting of more than one element. So we, we, we have lost invertibility. Um, and why is and how is this related to a choice of global structure? Uh, we can think of this BF theory and uh, consider it to be the 5D bulk to a 4D gauge theory based on the gauge algebra SUN. If we do so, uh, remember we have these topological surfaces in the 5D bulk. If these end on our 4D space time, they will yield lines. Uh, for instance, uh, B2 will give us Wilson lines, C2 will give us Toft lines. We can also consider dionic combinations. And from this point of view, choosing a, a global structure, choosing a set of lines in 40, 
um, it's also the same as choosing a collection of surfaces in phi phi that have trivial correlators or trivial commutation relations. Um, that's also familiar from quantum mechanics. We can prescribe, uh, we can fix the eigenvalues of a maximal commuting set of operators, but we cannot just fix the eigenvalues, say, of both X and B. Uh, and, and all of these considerations are actually implemented by a choice of topological boundary conditions. This would be the other slide of this slab in the picture. And just to give you a concrete example, if we pick the Richelieu boundary conditions for one of them, for instance, B2, that's the same as choosing global form uh, SUN for the gauge group, which means that the 4D theory has a global one form symmetry. And the background field for that uh, one form symmetry is nothing but the Dirichlet boundary condition itself for our field B2 in, in the 5P ball. And um, maybe you're wondering in, in a previous version of this picture, there was something else on the side of the red line. There was a residual uh, anomaly, so to say. And, and that can actually happen, in particular, if you choose more complicated mixed boundary conditions in which, roughly speaking, part of B2 is Dirichlet and also part of C2 is Dirichlet in quotation, uh, then you would get a, a theory that has a residual mixed anomaly. But for the sake of simplicity here, I'm showing an example in which after the choice of boundary conditions, there is no residual to often on. Okay, um, so this is somehow the prototype of the non-invertible part of our um, symmetry field theory. And, and what we would like to find in our string constructions are both ingredients. We would like to detect two anomalies, which would be the invertible part, and also detect BF terms, which are the hallmark of a non-invertible sector of the symmetry field theory. Um, okay, so uh, that seems to be a, uh, a good uh, moment to start discussing some of these examples. Um, now, uh, let's see, the first example I would like to mention has to do with uh, wrapped and five brains. And, and one might argue why, but why is this something interesting to consider? And, and one of the reasons is that it fits into an actually larger program, which is the classes program and all its various generalizations, uh, with, in which the central idea is to realize supersymmetric one of field theories in 40 uh, using a 60 superconformal field theory as starting point and reducing it on a Riemann surface including, for instance, defects and punctures. And, and here, of course, there is such a vast literature that I couldn't, I decided to put no references because it would be very hard <laughs> to put all the appropriate references. Um, and, and as it's well known, in this way, we can get a really vast landscape of 4D theories, including uh, formal theories that have a rich variety of global symmetries of various kinds. Now, this is a purely field theoretical point of view and it has its own merits. But let's focus on a special case, namely, suppose that the parent theory itself can be realized in M-theory using M-fives. So that could be, for instance, just a, a stack of M-fives on a smooth point, that's the, the two zeros of T of A-type, or we could put the stack on a C2 mod gamma AD singularity, that's reducing the supersymmetry to one comma zero, or we could alternatively put the same uh, M5s at the end of the world on, on Horjava width wall. And that's another way of getting one Z. In, in these situations, we have an alternative point of view on the 4D theory. Instead of going through six dimensional CFT and then down to 4D, we can study directly from 11 dimensions. And, and the goal of this analysis is to find the, the Toft anomalies, and as well as the, the BF terms responsible for the global structures directly from the M theory set. And why is that a, a useful thing to do? Because one might object that after all, we have, for instance, anomaly matching across dimensions. So if we start from the anomaly polynomial of the 60 theory, we can learn a lot of information about the 40 theory. But it's also true that the 60 point of view uh, doesn't 
capture everything and the 11 dimensional point of view complements it in interesting ways. And I would just, just to give you a couple of examples. So one is that, for instance, if there are punctures, the integration of the anomaly polynomial doesn't capture those punctures, whereas they can be uh, recovered from an 11 dimensional point of view. And even if there are no punctures, sometimes in the reduction from 60 to 40, uh, there is a very subtle pattern of decoupling modes that can be hard to, to track. And, and valuable information on that can be extracted by using a complementary 11D point of view. Um, so we have studied this in, a, in an example of a class uh, SK theory, for example. Uh, so given that there are good motivations to adopting an 11 dimensional point of view, uh, what is the main idea? Uh, it, essentially, it's, the, it's an old idea, it's anomaly inflow. If you have a stack of n five brains, they support chiral degrees of freedom, they have 12 anomalies, but the total system in theory is free of gauge anomalies. Well, all global, anomal global symmetries the field theory correspond to gauge symmetries in NQ, and there are no gauge uh, anomalies. And therefore, there's going to be a cancellation between the anomaly that lives on the word volume of the stack and a contribution from the ambient supergravity. So that's an example of this semi-classical computation that knows about quantum effects that I mentioned in the introduction. And this is based on the seminal analysis of the uh, local of, of the perturbative anomalies and also extended later on in, in works by Monet to global anomalies as well. And uh, in a sense, uh, here now I'll be, I'll be brief, the main idea is that we can obtain our inflow anomaly polynomial. So that's the semi-classical contribution that cancels the anomalies of the localized degrees of freedom by, as you can see, essentially integrating a formal 12 form that resembles the topological couplings of M theory. So uh, for instance, there is a famous CGG coupling in 11 dimension, and uh, it can be turned into a gauge invariant uh, 12 form by acting with a D and it's responsible for this G cube term. And then there is a famous hydrodirility correction that is needed for consistency. Now, this relation is about the 60 parent theory, and it's a rephrasing of the work of these authors. But rephrasing it in this way is useful because it allows for an immediate generalization if you are in 40. In that case, you will find an internal space, which is six dimensional and has some additional structures, but the philosophy is the same. The same 12 form, it's going to give you the inflow anomaly polynomial uh, if you integrate it in the internal space. And from that point of view, what we have to do is to compute G4 and compute X save. And the details are a bit technical and maybe not super important, but what I would like to emphasize though is that we have to include two sources of background fields. And that's important because the more background fields they include, the more global symmetries of the field theory you can probe. One source is familiar from those applying reductions. If your internal space has an isometry, it will give you a gauge field or a zero form uh, associated to that isometry. And that corresponds to fibering the internal space over external space. Now, space time here is four dimensional, but if you're doing descent, it's convenient to think about it as a six manifold. But then there is another part of the story, and namely that if we have non trivial cycle in the internal space, we can expand the M-theory three-form on those. And we also get, in general, massless P-form gauge fields in external space-time. And we should think of those as background fields for other global symmetries. And here, for instance, it's very natural to get not just zero-form symmetries, but a whole plethora of P-form symmetries, just because we could have several cycles in our internal space of various dimensions. So it's all very natural. And um, and just to flash you a concrete example, uh, I'll skip this. Um, I, I wanted to show you one concrete equation. It's a bit ugly, I apologize, it's pretty ugly, but um, I think it's an, uh, at least to showcase the sort of flexibility of this 
formalism. So what's going on here? Here I'm considering a specific example. I'm saying, let's say that our parent theory is this 6010 theory that comes from brains on a C2 mod Z2, C2 mod Z2 singularity. And let's put it on a Riemann surface doing topological twist and adding some flavor fluxes. And then applying this recipe, you can compute your inflow anomaly for the moment. There's a lot going on. We don't have to go through real details, but I can sort of flash what this is all about. So first, as a sort of proof of principle, what kind of symmetries we can see. There's a whole variety. As I mentioned, we have something from the isometries of our internal space. We have the external metric to probe gravitational anomalies. And then we have a bunch of symmetries that originate from cycles in the geometry. And some of them are regular zero form symmetries, but then we also have one form symmetries and even something that we might call a minus one form symmetry, which more appropriately, it's an anomaly in the space of coupling constants. So just as a proof of principle that this formalism is sensitive to a whole variety of generalized global symmetries. And then we also see various terms in the symmetry field theory encoded in this inflow anomaly polynomial. Some are regular anomalies for zero form symmetries, um, sort of the old kind, if you wish. Then we have some BF terms. Some of them involve uh, B2 potentials, just like the example I discussed before at length. And, and this term therefore is gonna be responsible for governing the choice of line operators in our uh, 4D theory. But then there is also another BF term, this one here, that involves on the one hand, some zero form symmetry, and on the other hand, a, uh, a two form symmetry that has this C3 uh, background. And, and, and therefore, this is yet another example of a choice of global structure. Um, and also, as you can see, there is a linear combination of these objects that participates to these topological couplings. So that means that that specific linear combination will be broken from U1 down to some cyclic subgroup. And the other two are going to remain unbroken. So in a sense, from this BF theory, you can also observe something that we might call a spontaneous symmetry breaking. You might naively think you have three ones, but this topological mass coupling is going to kill one of them and turn it into a discrete field. Um, so this was all a bit schematic, but the idea was to sort of give you a little uh, flavor of, of the variety of couplings that are accessible uh, with this method. And I ask, if you have mm -hmm. a, a class S type construction that gives you, say, an Adiris Douglas type theory, which is A, comma B type of suitable mating, that can have sort of one form symmetry that are, you know, attached to punctures. Um, so then I'm not sure how you would see backgrounds for these emerge in the sort of formalism. That, that's that? true. Um, it, it would be very interesting to, to understand this point better. I suspect. That... You, you actually want to somehow have perhaps less of a sort of cycle based approach, but more of a, you know, the Higgs field for this vibration. Right? There's some Higgs field that parentalizes so the, the cyber Witten curve for this problem. And then the pole structure of that should induce some of these couplings and the background fields. Yes, that's true. It's, it's an interesting complementary point of view. I suspect, I would imagine that what can be phrased in terms of the Higgs fields should also have an imprint in the geometry. But indeed, I don't fully understand this correspondence and it would be very uh, important, especially in relation to the mm -hmm. problem you mentioned, uh, in, in understanding how these one forms are encoded. Thank you. Uh, do you see spontaneous symmetry breaking of one form symmetries this way? Um, of one form symmetries, um, no. In all, of examples, the classes, really. in all examples we have, we find a collection of essentially decoupled. BF theory labeled by the genes of the Riemann surface. But, but maybe we haven't probed enough. Maybe there are other constructions where 
if you have more interesting topics. Um, okay, um, so uh, very briefly, a few keywords on the other part of the story, namely geometric engineering. What happens if you don't have any brain? Now, the standard inflow paradigm, uh, maybe it's not applicable in an obvious way, but we can still apply this sort of uh, edge mode approach that I mentioned. And here, just to set the stage, I'm thinking of M theory on a Calabial cone. It could be a, a real four dimensional cone that gives us a 7D theory, or more interestingly, uh, a threefold Calabial cone similarity that can give us 5DS CFTs. Of course, yeah, the vast number of them which exhibit a whole variety of interesting physical phenomena. And once again, our goal is given purely the geometry, can you extract the symmetries and the symmetry field? And the philosophy um, is essentially a dimensional reduction. And it can be motivated, roughly speaking, because since we're dealing with topological quantities, we can deform the cone to a cigar and then the cigar to a half line. And at least heuristically argue that a dimensional reduction of the couplings of 11D supergravity on the link, which is a compact smooth space, uh, as opposed to X, which has a singularity, is a, a viable strategy. And now we, uh, and therefore the, the starting point is again, it's pretty much the same. It's just a different avatar of the same I-12 we had before. And what we have to do is to reduce it on the internal space. But we face a technical challenge and namely that the symmetries we're interested in are actually encoded. They are encoded in cycles in the geometry, just like for the case of red 10 fives, but torsional cycles. So how do you do a Calusa Klein expansion along torsion? It's not so, so clear how to do that using forms. There are approaches that have been used successfully in the past, but they seem not to be fully systematic. And that's why we prefer to use differential cohomology. I won't have the time to really explain it, but essentially it's a language that allows you to organize your computation in a systematic way. And just to make contact to the example, the B-cube example that I mentioned earlier, let's have a quick look at just one example, the YPQs. So those are a famous family of Sasaki Einstein manifolds uh, that give you Calabial cones and the corresponding 60 SCFT. In this case, it's something that can be mass deformed to SUP uh, Yang Mills with transcendence at level Q. And if you look at the link, which is the uh, YPQ Sasaki Einstein itself, you will see that there is both a torsional class and that corresponds to discrete symmetry. In particular, it's a one form symmetry. And there is a non torsional class and that corresponds to a continuous symmetry. And our task is to find mixed anomalies between these. And our uh, differential cohomology analysis tells us the answer. To, we have these two things. And what we have to compute are these alpha one and alpha two. Toft anomaly coefficients. And they turn out to be a refinement of linking pairing. Linking pairing is the natural operation in torsional cycles. And here it turns out that we need a refined version of those that is actually sensitive to the spin structure on the link. That seems something impossible to compute, but there is actually a way of turning this into an intersection computation on the Calabial cone itself which in this case, it's even toric, which makes our life easier. The details are not terribly important, but it's a strategy that gives you very precise answers uh, as I sort of demonstrated here uh, for the sake of illustration. And that also agrees with previous field theoretical analysis. And moreover, we were also able to reproduce it using a PQ -web, PQ web approach. Now, um, there is really nothing special in this example. Um, in particular, the YPQs give you a Lagrangian field theory. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, can I quickly ask? So, on the previous slide, you said mm -hmm. sure. that you can recover the same results using the PQ5 brain web. I recall that in the paper there were some comments on um, the resulting theories not being gauge invariant under certain transformations that you wanted them to be. And it, what, what, um, what, what happened there? I mean, it's not purely geometric setup, so. 
it falls a bit outside of the paradigm that you were just presenting. Um, no, no, that's true. In, in a sense, the P2 wave of web approach makes contact with the first part of the talk because it involves brain sources. Yeah. And in, it's even more complicated here because the brain sources are going off to infinity, piercing the link in terminal space. Um, I think the phenomenon you're referring to, this lack of gauge invariance, is most likely an artifact of a description based on differential forms, which is very convenient computationally, but uh, it's maybe mathematically speaking not the best suited to capture uh, phenomena that are ultimately related to torsion in the theory frame. Uh, in practice, in the supergravity computation, you find that you can add terms that are proportional to the Bianchi identities, and they allow you to restore this gauge invariance. Um, so it could be that maybe there is a slightly different way of performing the computation where this issue of non gauge invariance never manifests itself, not even at the intermediate steps. Uh, but I don't believe that to be a sort of fatal flaw of the uh, computation or of the philosophy. I mean, that this approach based on the PQ web should be equally valid in, in general. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, in, uh, and just a couple more uh, quick comments. Um, so in, in this specific example, I ended up discussing something Tori, but that was not important. We can always translate the computation of torsion linking pairings to some uh, section in the KBL, even it doesn't have to be toric. And and this approach based on the bulk, I, I should I should emphasize the Toft anomaly coefficients alpha one, alpha two, they are intrinsically defined in terms of the linking space, L5 only. Resorting to X6 to compute them is just a computational device. So from this point of view, our approach is logically distinct from the Coulomb branch, branch approach that was advocated, uh, for instance, in this work. Um, okay, so I'll briefly come to my conclusions. We have seen how uh, in recent years, a topological point of view on global symmetries has emerged, which also addresses our d-dimensional theory with an auxiliary symmetry field theory that knows about the anomalies and the global structures of the QFT we would like to study. In string theory, we want to address all of these and compute them purely from the geometry of the brain system or the singular geometry we are probing. And I have described aspects of these computations, both for brains as well as for uh, pure geometric engineering. And as you have seen, in both situations, the key idea is to reduce the topological coupling of the ambient supergravity, thus giving a precise sense to this idea that a semi-classical computation in the ambient space can give you information on the quantum uh, degrees of freedom that are localized at the brain or at the Singularity in the geometry. There are several uh, natural directions that one can explore. I mentioned one specific example and here you have the outcomes, but of course there are many other cases. And uh, there are also, of course, constructions in F theory, which have already been um, recently uh, addressed in this language. Uh, it's also natural to wonder what happens if you try to combine both ingredients, torsion and brains, and that could also lead to interesting physical phenomena that might be worth studying. And um, ultimately, we would like to have a formalism that can describe everything at the same time. For instance, both isometry and torsional phenomena. And here, at least the naive guess seems to be some version of equivariant differential cohomology, but the, the real challenge is to make it easy to use and computable in practice. And finally, in this talk, I mostly focused on a higher form symmetry, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because the world of generalized symmetries contains so much more. I'm thinking, for instance, higher groups or even non invertible symmetries. And there is, I think, a lot to be learned. Even again, recently there have been works on higher groups in contexts uh, of end theory uh, geometric engineering, but there's also a lot that it's still to be explored. Okay, and that's it. I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Federico, for the great talk.
I'm going to a bit over time. I suggest if anyone has any urgent question, we might have an urgent question. And then if not, we can switch off the recording and we go to the discussion session. And anybody who wants to leave or has to leave can leave. So any 